Our message this morning is a, uh, or this afternoon rather, is one I'm very excited about, and I think you will be as well. It's entitled Adventist Amnesia. Who are we? I knew you'd like that. Well, let's pray together, and uh, we'll get right into our study of the Word of God. Father in heaven, as we go now into this message, we pray that it will be from your throne. We ask, Father, that you please will speak to us and through me. And Lord, I pray that you will continue to dwell upon this campus, Lord. You know that my wife and I must return back to Detroit, but we pray that your spirit will abide upon this campus, Father, and that your spirit will increase here. Lord, we just pray that you will bring about a revival of primitive and authentic godliness right here in this conference. Father, we pray that it will start with Elder Page and move down through the ranks and that it will start with the youngest and move up through the ranks. And Father, so that your spirit will meet right in the middle and that there will be a grand revival here in Central California. And Father, we pray now that as we study your word, that as we open this incredible book, that the spirit that inspired the scriptures will now become the spirit that instructs us in the scriptures. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text for today is taken from Revelation chapter 12. I invite you to go there with me. Revelation chapter 12. I purposefully saved this message for last. Because I think it is going to give us each something to chew on, something to think about. And I want to stimulate your mind. And I believe that the Word of God has the ability to do that, don't you? Amen. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Before we read the passage, I want to tell you an interesting little story. Before I was a Christian, as some of you might know, I was a skateboarder, right? A competitive skateboarder. And a good friend of mine named John... Nelson had a skateboard ramp in his backyard. And I remember that I enjoyed going over to his house and skateboarding on his ramp. And on one occasion, he uh, had built his ramp in such a way. Actually, on one occasion, I went over there and now I'm telling you. And he built his ramp in such a way that it, it's called a half pipe because it looks like half of a pipe. And what happens is, is that as the ramp kind of has a flat bottom and then goes up on the sides... Down this side, it wasn't just flat. John lived on a hill, and so the hill kind of, you know, tapered down away from the ramp. So the ramp itself was probably only about six feet tall. But because the hill tapered away, on the back side, it was probably something like a, oh, I don't know, a 10 or a 12 foot drop. And we had put some, you know, uh, wood things up there to, to secure the ramp. Well, I went over to John's on this afternoon. I was probably 20 years old, and I was uh, uh, going from one side over to the side that had the steep embankment behind it. I went up to do a, a trick, interestingly enough, that's called a nose pick. You might say to yourself, well, hey, I can already do that. Went up to do a nose pick, and what happened was, is as I landed on the edge of the ramp, I lost my balance. Now, when you are skateboarding on a ramp, it's, it's not uncommon to lose your balance, but normally you fall back into the ramp. You fall forward. But in this instance, I fell backward. Now, that would not normally be so bad because normally you would have kind of like a platform like we have here that covers the baptistry. But the ramp was not yet finished, and so there was no platform, just about a little six-inch thing. And when I started to fall backward, I fell down the steep embankment. And uh, what ended up happening was, is I, I kind of went hurtling back like this, and I landed on a cinder block. Now, you know what that is, right? A cinder block, and I landed head first. <laughs> and now you, this explains a lot now, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I landed head first on this cinder block, and it, it knocked me out. I mean, it just knocked me out cold, and it, it cut my head open quite, quite bad. And... Uh, what ended up happening was when I finally came to and was awake, I had a, a case of acute amnesia. I couldn't remember who I was. I could not remember for the life of me where I was. All I could remember was these people standing around me that did look vaguely familiar and they were trying to coax me into a bathroom to wash my head because it was, you know, moist with blood. And I was very confused. And as I looked here, I said, who are you? 
He said, my, uh, my name's John. I'm trying to get you into the bathroom. And I looked at my friend. I said, who are you? And here I was dripping with blood and bleeding. And I, I went through this case of acute amnesia. It, it, I think it's almost gone away now. <laughs> no, seriously, it, it lasted maybe just an hour or two. But it was a very uncomfortable circumstance to be suddenly unaware of who you were and what you were doing in a certain place. Has anybody here ever had amnesia before? It's really a very uncomfortable experience. And when I finally came to, I remember looking back at that and being scared that you could just, in a moment, lose track of your identity. What I want to talk to you today is, is about, I want to talk to you about something today that I think is very important. And my concern for the Seventh-day Adventist Church is that living now, coming into the third millennium, uh, since our Lord was here, I, I fear that we are facing a crisis of identity. Could it be that we as a church have an acute case of amnesia? The message that I want to present to you today will help to strengthen your sense of who we are as Seventh-day Adventists. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, we read a verse of Scripture that you have read before and you are familiar with. You probably could even quote it by heart. The Bible says, and the dragon, now who's the dragon? It's the devil, it's Satan. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Now who would the woman be? That'd be the church. So the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her what? Seed which keep the commandments of God and have the what? The testimony of Jesus. Now, as many of you are aware, I came into the Seventh-day Adventist Church about six years ago. I was baptized June 6, 1996. And when I was baptized into this church, I came into it. I came into Christ and I came into this church with the understanding that this church fulfilled the remnant of her seed that is spoken of here in Revelation 12, 17. That was my understanding. That's what the Bible study lessons taught me. And that's what I have believed. To put it in very common vernacular that you will be familiar with, I came into this church believing that this church was not better than other people, but that it was peculiar and that it was, in fact, the remnant church of Bible prophecy. Now, that's what I believe, and I believe that's what the Bible teaches. Now, my question for you is, is that what you believe? Now, I want to emphasize that that does not mean that we think we are one bit better than anybody else. Amen? Just as the prophets of the Old Testament were not better than the common people, they were simply called at a certain time for a certain purpose to give a certain message. Are you with me? Yes or no? Not better, just peculiar. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Who is this group that is referred to as the remnant? Are Seventh-day Adventists preaching triumphalism? Are Seventh-day Adventists preaching elitism and exclusivism when we say that we are the remnant? I don't think so. The reason that I don't think so is that right there in the passage, we are given two characteristics that help us to understand who this remnant is. Look at it right there. It says, which keep the commandments of what? God and have the what? testimony of Jesus. Now, in this verse alone, there are two criterion, keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus. There are other passages that we could go to, but apparently God wants us to be able to find and identify who this last day group of people is. So he gives us characteristics. He gives us what word did I say? Characteristics. So what we do, it's actually a very simple process. It's, it's uh, reasoning in a linear fashion. What you do is you find the characteristics, one, two, three, four, five, six, however many there may be, and then you find an organization or a church that meets not five out of six or four out of six, or if it's, if it's ten, nine out of ten or eight out of ten, but all ten out of ten or all six out of six. Does that make good sense? Yes or no? It's really a very simple, logical phenomenon. 
we find what the characteristics are, and then we find a church or an organization that fits that. And today I want to go on record as saying, I believe that if you study the book of Revelation and the rest of the New and the Old Testament, you will find that there are several identifying characteristics of God's last day church, and I believe that this church is fulfilling all of them. Now, I didn't say that I thought this church was perfect. Amen? I didn't say that, and I don't believe that. But I do believe that this church, sinful, faulty, and defective though she be, is the one object upon which Jesus Christ bestows His supreme regard. Now, let's dissect this a little bit. Let's see if we can come to the conclusion today. Who is the remnant spoken of in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17? Do we just believe it because we've been told to believe it? Do we just believe it because our pastors believe it? Why do we believe that we are the remnant church of Bible prophecy? Before answering that question, I want to share with you something that I find very, very helpful. Has anybody here ever read the book uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis? Raise your hand. That's a brilliant little book. I was hoping I'd see more hands go up than that. I recommend that you get it. It's just about 160 pages or 140 pages. It's entitled Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Now, not everything that C.S. Lewis wrote was good, but much of what he wrote is really quite good. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis makes what I consider to be a very compelling case for Jesus' messiahship. And I want to share that with you. We would call this a messianic apologetic. In other words, Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, and now C.S. Lewis sets out to defend that claim. Let me tell you what he says. C.S. Lewis says that based upon the claims that Jesus made in the New Testament, based upon the claims, what word did I say? The claims. Now, let's, let's think of a few of those claims that Jesus made about himself. I can think of one in John chapter 8 and verse 58. When he said, before Abraham was, I am. That was a claim to be the Old Testament God of Exodus chapter 3 and 4 that said to Moses, I am that I am. I can think of another claim in John chapter 10 and verse 33 when Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Now, that's a very strong claim. There are many different claims that Jesus made. I can think of him sitting there on the well with the woman in John chapter 4. And he said to her when she said, we know that Messiah cometh. He said to her, I that speak unto thee am he. In other words, we could go through if we had time today and survey many different passages in the New Testament where Jesus made the claim to be the divine son of God. Are you with me? Yes or no? Now, listen to my words very carefully. Just because Jesus made the claim doesn't make it true. He had to back up that claim. And did he do it? Yes or no? For example, if I claim to be the Son of God, I could make that claim, but that doesn't mean it's true just because I say so. In other words, Jesus was not self-authenticating. He said, this is who I am, and then he gave abundant evidence to prove that he was who he said he was. Amen? Now, here's the point that C.S. Lewis makes. Listen carefully. C.S. Lewis said that Jesus Christ, based upon the claims that he made about himself, must be one of three things. Are you ready? Must be one of three things based upon his claims. Number one, he must either be a liar because he made some fantastic claims. Or number two, he must be a lunatic, deluded and crazy Or number three, he must really be the Lord of heaven. Are you with me? Based upon the claims that Jesus made about himself, in other words, we do not believe, as many modern day uh, atheists and agnostics would say, we do not believe that it would be appropriate to say Jesus was just a good man. We would not call somebody that walked around claiming to be the divine son of God, we wouldn't say he's a good man. If we thought he was not telling the truth, we'd say he's a little off his rocker. Are you with me? Yes or no? Or in the case of the Roman pontiff, we'd say he's a liar. Are you with me? Yes or no? We don't believe the claims that are made. So Jesus makes these incredible claims and C.S. Lewis says, hey, as I look at this thing, he must either be a liar or he must be a lunatic or he must be the Lord of glory. But we cannot say about Jesus that he was just a good man. Are you understanding? Yes or no? Now, I want to take that a little further. Let me give you an example that I came up with myself. That was a messianic apologetic. Let me give you now a biblical apologetic. 
based upon the claims that the Bible makes about itself. Are you with me? Yes or no? Let's think of a few of the claims that the Bible makes about itself. I think of, is it 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, where the Bible makes the claim about itself that all Scripture is what? Given by what? Inspiration of God. Now, that's quite a claim, isn't it? That's a fantastic claim. I think of another one in Peter in which he said that holy men of old spoke or spake as they were moved by the what? The Holy Spirit. Now, the incredible point here is this. The Bible makes the claim to be the actual word of God. Now, I happen to believe that that claim is true. Do you? But listen very carefully. Just because it makes the claim to be the word of God does not mean that it is the word of God. Do you follow me? Yes or no? What we then have to do is submit it to a battery of tests to determine whether or not its claims are valid. Let me give you a good example. The Book of Mormon, for our dear friends, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. By the way, I think the devil came up with that name. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I do believe that there is a Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I just don't happen to think that it's the Mormon Church. Are you with me, yes or no? Now, that's not to poke fun. I just don't believe it. But here's the problem. When those dear young people come to my door, they want to hand me a book. Now, what's the name of that book they want me to read? Well, it's not the Bible or we'd get along just fine. They want me to read the Book of Mormon written by Joseph Smith. Now, in that book, you will find that the Book of Mormon also makes some extraordinary claims about itself. It, too, claims to be the divinely revealed will of God. Now, listen carefully. Just because the book makes the claim, does that mean it's true? No, it doesn't. Now, the Bible also makes the claim, but I'm glad to tell you tonight that the Bible not only makes the claim, it can prove or validate that claim. Amen? So, based upon the claims that the Bible makes about itself, it too could fit into one of three categories. Okay, listen carefully. Based upon the claims that it makes, the Bible can only be one of three things. It's either fiction, follow me, or it's false, or it's fact. Now, I happen to believe that it's fact. How about you? But because the Bible makes some extraordinary claims, we cannot just put it on the shelf with all the other books and say, well, that's a nice piece of literature. There are so-called greats in, in the English language, literary greats, and we think of things like To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee or Pearl S. Buck's A Good Earth. These are the so-called classics, but not one of those books claims to be the Word of God. Amen? Amen? So what happens is, because the Bible chooses to make this claim about itself, this is an extraordinary book, and we must treat it differently because it claims to be something bigger than these other books. You with me? Yes or no? So it's either fact, or it's false, or it's fiction. Just as Jesus was either liar, lunatic, or Lord. Now let me give you the third one. You've got the feel for this idea now. Based upon the claims that Jesus made, he was one of three things. Based upon the claims that the Bible makes, he was one of three things. Now let me give you my eschatological apologetic. In other words, my end time apologetic. And it applies directly to the Seventh-day Adventist church. Based upon the claims, the what word did I say? The claims that the Seventh-day Adventist church makes about itself. Now, before I tell you the three categories, let's just be sure that the church actually makes these claims. So I'm reading now from an official documentation that is put out and sponsored by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's called the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary. You ever heard of it before? I've met a lot of Adventists who have it, but I've met few who actually use it. Make sure that you're in the category that owns it and uses it. Amen? Amen. Now, mine's falling apart, and if any one of you has a set that's just gathering dust on your shelf, I'll be glad to give you an address you can send it to. Amen? Listen very carefully. In the passage on Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, this is the comment that our official publication, our official commentary makes. Now, you're tuning in now. Quote, From the very first, Seventh-day Adventists have boldly proclaimed the three angels' messages as God's last appeal to sinners to accept Christ 
and have humbly believed their movement to be the one here designated in Revelation 12, 17 as the remnant. Did you catch that? No other religious body is proclaiming this composite message and none other meets the specification laid down in chapter 12 and verse 17. Hence, therefore, none other has a valid scriptural basis for claiming to be the remnant. Are you with me? Yes or no? That's an official publication, and in that official publication... Now, the next paragraph goes on to say that that does not mean that we believe we're better. Amen? It also does not mean that we believe that only Seventh-day Adventists will be saved. Now, if you, if you understand that, say amen. We do not believe that, but we do believe that this church, sinful, faulty, and defective, though she be, is in fact God's remnant community of faith. Now, if you don't believe that, that's your prerogative, but that's what the church teaches. Are you with me, yes or no? Now, what I want to show you today is that that's also what the Bible teaches. Now, based upon the claims that the Seventh-day Adventist Church makes about itself, it, too, is one of three things. Are you listening very carefully now? We are either wrong, are you with me? Or we are ridiculous, or we're right. You get it? We're either wrong, we've either incorrectly interpreted the Scriptures and that makes us wrong, or we're ridiculous, we're totally off our rocker, or just maybe we're right. Now, beloved, what I want to do today with you is show you why I happen to believe that we are, in fact, the remnant church of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. My thesis this afternoon is this, and please listen carefully. I believe that the church is on the verge of a crisis. I do not believe, though, that that crisis is a crisis of worldliness. Do you hear what I said? I think it's a crisis of identity that stands on the horizon ready to meet this community of faith. I want to answer several questions today. Who are we? Why are we here? Do we have anything to offer to the world around us? And are we the remnant of Revelation 12:17? Our message is entitled Adventist Amnesia. Who are we? As we continue with this message, I want to ask you ten questions. Are you ready for them? Don't bother writing them down because I'm going to move much too fast for that. I want to ask you ten questions that I came up with and formulated myself. And I want you to know before I even read the questions that I personally answer every single one of these in the affirmative. Now, I'm not asking you to agree with me today. I just want you, as I read the question, I want you to answer right now quickly. Think, do I think yes or no to this question? You ready? You'll get a feel for it. Number one, is the second coming imminent? Now, you don't have to answer out loud, but you can if you want. I'm just asking you to think. In fact, it might be kind of fun if we answered out loud. Number two, does Revelation chapter 10 foretell the Millerite revival? Number three, does Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17 foresee the rise of the Seventh-day Adventist church? Number four, will Catholicism, spiritualism, and Protestantism unite to enforce the papal institution of Sunday? Number five, Will the seventh-day Sabbath be the testing issue in the Mark of the Beast crisis? Number six, did Jesus Christ enter into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary in 1844? Number seven, was Ellen White a genuine prophetic voice? Number eight, is the peculiar Seventh-day Adventist lifestyle, including healthful living, and abstinence from worldliness, God's will for His end-time people. Number nine. Is the Seventh-day Adventist church fulfilling in any meaningful way the eschatological prophecies of Daniel and Revelation? And number ten. Last but not least. 
is the end time scenario depicted in Ellen G. White's book, The Great Controversy, still relevant or is it denominational poppycock? It's relevant. Now, beloved, I think that based upon how you answer those ten questions is going to be very, very telling in what your mission is as a Seventh-day Adventist. And now listen to my words carefully. Identity drives mission. Did you hear that? You might want to write that down somewhere. Identity drives mission, and then in turn, mission strengthens identity. Are you following me, yes or no? Now, I'm going to give you three examples of this, and this is going to be our message for today. Let me repeat it. Identity determines mission, and mission strengthens identity. If we are, as we have taught that we are, as the church says that we are, as I believe the Bible teaches that we are, if we are, in fact, the remnant church of Bible prophecy, do you think that that would then have a telling effect upon our mission to the world? Yes or no? Yes. But watch what happens, beloved. If you pull the rug out from underneath our identity, guess what happens to our mission? Disappears. Disappears. I repeat, identity drives and determines mission, and mission in turn strengthens identity. Today I want to give you three examples of this. Two of them are successes, and one is a terrible, tragic failure. Let's start with the good news, the successes. Go with me to the Gospel of John. We go to John chapter 9. The first example is the person of... Jesus. Jesus will be exhibit A, so to speak, in our thesis that identity drives mission. I make the case for you today that Jesus Christ knew who he was. He knew why he was here and he was not confused as to his identity or his mission, Jesus said plainly, this is who I am, and this is why I'm here. Are you with me? In John chapter 9, I wish we had time to read the entire chapter, because you know this is the one where the disciples find the blind man, right? And it's a fantastic story, but I just want to read two verses in John chapter 9. The first is verse 4, Jesus speaking. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the what? Light of the world. Jesus here makes the claim that he is the light of the world. Now, I happen to believe that today. Do you? Now, notice verse 4. In verse 5, he makes the claim, I am the light of the world. And verse 4, that, that sense of identity of who he was drove Jesus' mission. And notice verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. His mission was to do the work of God as fast as possible because a time was coming when there would be no more work. You with me? His identity, the light of the world. His mission, to bring light to everybody that sits in darkness. Does this make sense? Yes or no? Now, let me give you a good example. When Jesus was baptized, according to both Matthew chapter 3 and Luke chapter 3, there was a divine voice that came from heaven. And I want you to tell me, what did that voice say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, listen to my words very carefully. That was one of the very, very, very few instances in which Jesus had a miracle that told him who he was. Do you hear what I said? Before this, Jesus learned about his mission and his identity primarily on his mother's knee and through a study of the Old Testament. Did you know that? Yes or no? And when God there on that wonderful baptismal day gave Jesus a miracle, it was only to confirm the conclusions that Jesus had already arrived at through his study of the scripture. Are you following me? Yes or no? 
Now, listen very carefully. I'm reading now from the little book, Desire of Ages, page 112. One sentence, so you'll be able to remember it. Desire of Ages, page 112. Speaking of these words, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. She says, these words of confirmation were given to inspire faith in those who witnessed the scene and, listen carefully, and to strengthen the Savior for his own mission. Did you get that? In other words, God spoke those words at that precise time for two reasons. To give faith to those who were there at the baptismal experience, but it wasn't just for those who were watching, it was for the one, capital O, who participated in the baptism. In other words, it helped to strengthen Jesus' identity. Are you with me, yes or no? So Jesus could walk away in confidence, total confidence, totally sure that he was, in fact, the divine son of God. Now, watch what happens. Jesus is baptized in Matthew chapter three. Where does Jesus go in Matthew chapter four? Go there with me, Matthew chapter four. What I want you to notice, and this is absolutely essential for Seventh-day Adventists to understand especially as we're living in a day in which relativism and pluralism is wreaking havoc on the world and is making inroads into our own church. Now, notice Matthew chapter 4. This is fantastic, beloved. Notice this. Verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the who? The devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered, and you would be too, Verse 3, and when the tempter came to him, he said... Now, do you think the devil's smart, yes or no? He's a lot smarter than you and I. The devil knew exactly what to say. The devil, with his massive intellect, his genius intellect, he knew the very words that would, would be best calculated to try, if possible, to get Jesus to sin. Now, you and I know that Jesus didn't sin, but the devil didn't know that yet. And he, he had thought about these words and he had come up with, he had 4,000 years to think about it. And the first words that come out of the devil's mouth when he speaks here to Jesus is, if thou be the son of God. Are you with me? Yes or no? What's the devil trying to do? He's trying to cause him, and you're paying attention now, to doubt his identity. Are you with me? If you be the Son of God, prove it. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The devil was not done, though. Verse 5, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him... If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For a second time, what he is now trying to do is cause Jesus to doubt his identity. Why? Because if Jesus for a moment doubted his identity, the whole mission would be destroyed. Because remember, identity drives mission and mission strengthens identity. The first two temptations that Satan brought before Jesus was not so much make bread or cast yourself down from the temple. The temptation was, are you really who you think you are? I mean, are you sure you're the son of God? Now, if you read about this in the Desire of Ages, it's really quite fascinating because what we're told is, is that Satan came and he didn't come like a little, you know, gargoyle with a pitchfork or some silly thing like that. He came as a beautiful, bright, resplendent, glorious angel. And here's the son of God, weak and emaciated sin. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, he wasn't pretty. Are you with me? And he did not look like the Son of God. I guarantee it. Are you following me now? But you know who did, did look like somebody that, that was from heaven? Satan. And here in that context, Satan looking resplendent and dignified and glorious and wonderful says to this weak, emaciated wraith of a human being, are you the Son of God? Are you following me, yes or no? And if Jesus had have relied upon his outward stimulus and experience, he would have doubted his identity, but he relied upon the Word of God. He clung to those words, Thou art my beloved Son, 
in whom I'm well pleased. He clung to it. He clung to his sense of identity and that drove his mission and the devil ran away like a little dog with his tail between his legs. Amen. Now, let me ask you a question right now that is really quite significant. You might not catch the significance immediately, but listen carefully. Did Jesus Christ have something relevant to offer to the society and people of his day? Did you catch the question? Did Jesus Christ have something relevant to offer to the people and society of his day? Yes or no? I want a better yes than that. Yes. Now, let me ask you a second question. If you would have asked the people of Jesus' day... If you would have gone to them, you would have done a, a, a poll. You would have passed out a poll to all the people of Jesus' day. Was, Look at this guy over here. He claims to be the Son of God. And you would have polled them. Would they have said that he had something meaningful to offer? No way. What did he have to offer? He was a meek and lowly Galilean that was riding on a donkey. We needed a mighty military general. And here's the point. The people of Jesus' day didn't think he was relevant, but he was relevant. Now, let that sink in for the Seventh-day Adventist church, beloved. We are being told today that we need to make our message relevant. Our message is relevant. You don't need to make it relevant. It is relevant. It is not a message. It is the message. Now, here's the incredible thing. Listen carefully. Follow me now. It's very important. We do not determine whether or not we are relevant by what contemporary society thinks. And if we try to dress our message up to make it look better to contemporary society, we're going to lose our identity and we're going to lose the message. The message is the message and we must preach it with power and let the chips fall where they may. But we must be faithful to our identity and we must be faithful to our mission. Jesus had something very relevant to offer. Jesus had something very meaningful to offer, but the people of his day certainly didn't think so. Beloved, today you and I, only by the grace of Jesus, amen, only by the grace of Jesus, we have been called not with a message, but with the message. And beloved, the whole world around us doesn't know it's relevant, but it is. I have a cute little story I like to tell. And it will help this point to settle right into your mind. I hope you never forget this illustration. I want you to picture in your mind a woman. She's young, 30 years old. And she has lost her only child and her husband. She lost her only child and a husband, just her only, her only husband and her only child just, just, just one week before in a car accident. Tragic car accident. Now, do you think she's in pain? She's in great pain. And get the picture in your mind now. She's sitting in her house. The house in which she was supposed to, to raise up her little girl. The house in which she was supposed to grow old with her husband. She's sitting in that house and she's alone. Now, if a pastor comes over to that house, do you think that that woman has some, some felt needs that that pastor needs to minister to? Yes or no? You'd better believe it. A pastor going into that home would have a whole armful full of felt needs to minister to. But now I want your imagination to continue with me. Here she is. She's sitting in that rocking chair, rocking, and she's lonely and she's sad. And she thinks that her greatest need is to understand why she lost her husband and why she lost her daughter. That's what she thinks her greatest need is. But she doesn't know. Now, you and I do. She doesn't know that in her basement at that very moment, two live wires have crossed and have started a fire. Are you with me now? Yes or no? Now, she doesn't know that. She is not aware that she has a greater need. See, this world has its needs. Just as that woman had her needs and every one of us recognizes that the hungry need to be fed. Amen? Every one of us recognizes that we should be searching diligently to find cures for cancers and other things. Every one of us recognizes that this world has needs and that woman in that house would have had needs. But down in the basement, unbeknownst to her, we know there's a greater need. 
The house is about ready to burn up. And if the pastor came and knocked on that door, it would not have been time for pleasantries. It would have been time to pull the woman out of the house. And when she was brought out of that house and got away from that that need, got away from that, that danger that she didn't even know she had, now you can start ministering to her other needs. Beloved, make the incredible application. The world today has its various and sundry needs, and the reason that they don't think that the Seventh-day Adventist message is relevant is because they don't even know the message. Are you with me? So, beloved, we have really a two-tiered task. Listen carefully, because many of our people don't understand this. They think that the world is going to come and tell us that this is what they're looking for and we're going to deliver it. No, 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 no. As Seventh-day Adventists, we have a two-tiered task. We need to let them know that they have a need, and then we need to give them the solution to the need. Do you see it, yes or no? See, I didn't know that I had a need until I knew that I had a need. That was very profound, wasn't it? Did you follow it? I mean, here I was, 23 years old, 4.0 student, top of my class, teaching anatomy at the University of Wyoming, and I was studying to be a doctor, and life was grand. Now, if you would have come up to me and said, do you think that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has anything meaningful to offer to your life? I would have said, the Seventh who? The Seventh-day Adventist Church, never heard of them. They don't have anything to do with me. But once I read the book, The Great Controversy, suddenly I saw that there was a need that I was unaware of. And I found that the church and the Lord Jesus Christ fit like a puzzle piece right into that need. So today as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a two-tiered mission. We must alert the world to the fact that something grand and awesome and terrible is coming. And then, hallelujah, we don't just sell them the problem. We sell them the solution. Now, three instances. Number one, Jesus, he was a success. His sense of identity drove his mission. Go with me now to the book of Acts, Acts chapter one, to our second example. Acts chapter one. Our second example is the New Testament church, Acts chapter 1. Notice with me verse 8. Jesus here speaking to his disciples. We look now at our second example of how mission is driven by identity. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Jesus says, but ye shall receive what? Power. Power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be what? Witnesses unto who? Witnesses unto me. We could we could put that this way, couldn't we? Ye shall be my witnesses. Would that be fair? Yes or no? By the way, do you know what the Greek word is there? Witnesses. It's it's the word martyrs. Yeah, you shall be my martyrs. The word means witness. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, when Jesus said that, when Jesus told the New Testament church there that they were going to be his witnesses to the entire world, do you think that that, was, that, 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 that meant something to them, yes or no? Yes or no? It was, it was fantastically important to them. Jesus here was taking, as it were, the scepter and he was giving the scepter that he himself had been bearing and he gave it to the church and he said, now what you've been watching me do for the last three and a half years, I'm giving it to you to do. In other words, he passed the baton, he passed the torch to the church and he invested this church with a sense of identity. You are my witnesses. Are you with me? Yes or no? Now, do you think that they clung to that sense of identity? Just read the book of Acts. They 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 were very keenly aware. We have been called upon by Jesus to tell this wonderful message. And the various, you know, Caesars and others and the Pharisees and the scribes would say, you can't preach that here. You can't teach that here. And they'd say, we're sorry. We'd love to obey you, but we have to obey Jesus first. We ought to obey God rather than men. And they were faithful to their mission because they had a sense that they were, in fact, God's witnesses. Are you with me? Now, let me show you that in Acts chapter 5. Let me show you how this works itself out in the life. Acts chapter 5. 
Notice with me, beginning in verse 27, Acts chapter 5 and verse 27. The Bible says, and when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest asked them. Verse 28, verse 28, saying, did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in his name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, all Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Verse 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hung on a tree. Verse 31, him as God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Verse 32, and we are his what? We are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that what? Obey him, verse 33, and when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and they took counsel that they might what? Slay them. Now, here's the incredible thing. When they came to the disciples and they said, do not teach that way at the peril of your own life, at the peril of your own health. Do not teach in the name of Jesus. They said, we cannot obey you. We must obey God first because we are his witnesses. That's exactly what Jesus said they would be. He said, and ye shall be my Witnesses, And so their sense of their divine identity drove them to preach even at the peril of their own life. Amen? If you would have gone to Peter and said, Peter, who do you think you are? He'd say, I'm a witness of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? If you would have gone to the early disciples, who do you think you are anyway? I am a witness for Jesus. Now, here's a second success story. Just as Jesus clung to his sense of identity and that drove his mission, so too the early church clung to that sense of identity and it drove their mission. But you know what happened in the second, third, and fourth centuries, don't you? In the second, third, and fourth century, what crept into the church was paganism. And in bringing paganism into the church, and oh, I could go on, but I better not. In bringing paganism into the church, see, they thought that was the best way to win the pagans. Are you, are you making the application? They thought that the best way to get the pagans was to bring the paganism into the church. And look at all the people that are coming to church now. Are you following me? Yes or no? Now, many people want to do the same thing today. I say, wow, hmm, we're having trouble reaching the pagans. Maybe we better bring a little pagan music onto the stage and we'll get more pagans in. Are you following me? Maybe we better have a pagan drama at the front of the church and we'll get more pagans to come. Beloved, listen to me. I got nothing wrong with pagans coming into the church, but let's let's invite them to become unconverted from paganism and converted to Jesus. Amen. If we think that we are doing ourselves a favor by employing worldly wise means to bring worldly people just into the confines of a building, beloved, listen to me. This is just a piece of wood. If you get somebody into the confines of your church, the two by fours and the drywall and the ceiling tiles and the carpet and the pews, having somebody in that edifice, in that building does not mean they are a follower of Jesus. There is more to church growth than having numbers in the sanctuary. Beloved, it is not church growth if we bring a bunch of pagans just to sit in a pew for an hour on Sabbath. That is not church growth God's way. We hear a lot about church growth in terms of numbers. How about church growth in terms of holiness? Now, beloved, we could go into this, but basically what happened was in the second, third and fourth centuries, the church lost its sense of identity. And in losing their sense of identity, the papal apostasy was birthed right out of that. Now, I have given you two success stories, the apostolic church and Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at a a dismal failure. The last example. A dismal failure. That proves that when you lose your identity, you have lost everything. We're going to look at Israel. Go with me to the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17. I want to show you what I consider to be 
some of the saddest verses in all of the Bible. Seriously. Some of the saddest verses in all of the Bible. Second Kings chapter 17. I'm beginning in verse 32. Second Kings chapter 17 and verse 32. The failure of Israel was not simply apostasy and backsliding. The failure of Israel was a loss of their sense of identity. The story of the Old Testament is the story of a nation who was called to be great, but who lost its sense of identity and became a failure. And in 2 Kings chapter 17, beginning in verse 32, we find here a passage that is absolutely incredible. It says, So they, speaking of Israel, the ten tribes of Israel, so they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord and served their own gods. And you read that right. They feared the Lord. They feared God in heaven. And what else did they do? They served their own gods. It says, after the manner of the nations whom they were carried away from thence, verse 34, unto this day they do they do after the former manners. They fear not the Lord, neither do they do after his statutes or after their his ordinances or after the law and commandment, which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. Verse 35, with whom the Lord had made a covenant and charged them, saying, ye shall not fear other gods nor bow yourselves to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. Verse 36, But the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt with great power and a stretched out arm, Him shall you fear, and Him shall you worship, and to Him shall you do sacrifice. And the statutes and the ordinances and the law and the commandment which He wrote for you, ye shall observe to do evermore. And ye shall not fear other gods. Verse 38, and the covenant that I have made with you, you shall not forget, neither shall ye fear other gods. See, the the same thing is coming up. Other gods, other gods, other gods. Verse 39, but the Lord your God ye shall fear, and he shall deliver you out of the hand of all your enemies. Verse 40, how be it? They did not hearken, but they did after their former manner. And notice verse 41 and underline it and put a big star by it. It says, so these nations feared the Lord and served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers, so do they unto this day. Now let that sink in. They had become so accustomed, and listen carefully, to the nations that surrounded them and their practices and their ways and their ceremonies and their traditions and their rites and their mores. They become so accustomed to that that slowly but surely they began to assimilate their ideas, their customs, their styles of worship to where they came to the place where they didn't serve one or the other. They were serving both. The Bible says they feared the Lord and they served their graven images. Now, how, pray tell, is that possible? Jesus himself said no man can have two masters. He will love the one and and despise the other. He will hold to the one and, and hate the other. The point is this. They were doing both. Why? Because, beloved, they had allowed themselves to lose their sense of divine identity. And when they lost their identity, they began to wonder about how the Amorites worshiped. And they began to wonder, how about those Moabites, how they were? I hear they got a lot of people coming to church. Are you hearing me? And as they began to wonder about how the other, they began to incorporate methodologies from the other nations. And what ended up happening was, is they had a mixture, an amalgamation of truth and error. And my Bible calls that Babylon. Are you understanding this? Yes or no? Now, what caused them to do that? They lost their sense of identity. Now, beloved, I have already told you I am a big fan of the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary, and I am not in the custom of reading from it at the pulpit, but let me just please spare me and suffer me here to read you just one paragraph. Commenting on this verse of Scripture, listen to this very carefully. Thus ends the history of Israel. 
A people who should have been a peculiar treasure to the Lord above all people. Never had a people started out with greater promise. Never did a nation meet with greater humiliation and reproach. Israel discovered by sad experience that righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Little is known of the northern tribes subsequent to their being taken into captivity. Last sentence. Many probably merged with the peoples among whom they lived and lost their identity. Are you understanding this, yes or no? Do you understand why the message is entitled Adventist Amnesia? Who are we? If we forget who we are, if we're not sure about our identity, beloved, it is just a matter of time before we lose our mission. Now, let's close this thing up, and I invite you to go with me to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. The Bible says, and the dragon, we know who that is, no, no question about the identity there. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Again, no question, the woman is the church. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The official teaching of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I believe the biblical teaching, is that this church is not better, but that this church does fulfill the specifications of this verse, and that we are, in fact, the remnant church of Bible prophecy. Now, do you believe that? Beloved, I hope and pray that you do because I know for a fact. I'm not telling you something that I read in a book. I know for a fact that as a church, as an evangelist who traveled around for the better part of four years being in this conference and this conference and this conference and this conference and this church and this church and this church and this pastor and this pastor and this pastor, the great, great, great crisis that is facing this church is a crisis of identity and we had better come to grips with it. We are either the remnant church of prophecy or we are just another denomination, another topping on the salad bar. And there are many, let me take this a step further, there are many even within our own ranks who pull back. They don't like this idea that we're the remnant. They don't like it. They pull back from it and they want us just to become another congregationalist church. Now, I want to go on record as saying that I have great confidence in Elder Page and the leadership of this conference. As many of you know, I am from Michigan, and I have implicit confidence in Elder Gallimore and his administration. I can only say that I wish that all of our administrators and that all of our pastors and that all of our laity shared the same sense of identity and resolve that these men have. In closing, I read for you one of my favorite statements. And this is taken from the fourth volume of the Testimonies. Page 595. Write it down. Listen to this first sentence. This is incredible. 4T595. It is as certain that we have the truth as that God lives. What do you think of that? You think Ellen White had a sense of her identity? Let me read that again. It is as certain that we have the truth as that God lives. Lives. I'm not even going to read the rest of the statement. Beloved, it is as certain as that God lives that we have the truth. And tonight, I don't believe that because my church tells me to believe it. And I don't believe it just because Ellen White said it either. I believe it because I have studied it from the Bible and I know that that is what the Bible teaches. Now, let me give you the six S's. 
So you can write them down and you can be very aware that this is what this church stands on. And every one of these things is rooted in the scriptures. Number one is the scriptures themselves. The scriptures being the divine, inerrant, infallible word of God. Number two, the seventh day Sabbath. It is scriptural, it is biblical, and it is one of the foundational pillars of this church. And if you believe that, say amen. Amen. Yeah, I know that because whenever I preach my evangelistic meetings, I invite somebody. I say, I'll give you $10,000 if you can show me one text that says we should keep Sunday. And I have not written that check yet. So number two, the Sabbath. Number three, the imminent second coming. We still believe that Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Now, I don't know if it's two years or if it's 20 years, but I don't think it's a thousand years. Amen. Number four, the state of the dead. Let me repeat so you can be keenly aware of it. When you die, you do not ascend immediately to heaven. Contrary to popular belief and opinion, when you die, you go into the grave, you sleep the sleep of death and you await the resurrection. Number five, the sanctuary and Christ's ministry there. The sanctuary. Now, I have I have come to understand that in the church, the sanctuary has been an ongoing hot potato. And I'll tell you why. It's not because it's not clear in the scriptures. It's because the devil hates it. And the devil is raising up little voices here and there. I could say names and sometimes I wish I would, but I'm not going to today. Little names that just coming up, questioning this, beloved. But any serious student of the Bible is not going to question it. It is as plain as the noonday sun. And number six, the spirit of prophecy. I want you to know today, I want to go on record and I am not ashamed of it. I am not too smart to believe that Ellen White was a prophet. I want to go on record as saying that I believe that she was a genuine prophetic voice. I don't think she was perfect, but I think she was a prophet. By the way, none of the Old Testament prophets were perfect. Amen? I mean, you have Elijah in a cave asking God to kill him. Number one, the scriptures. Number two, the Sabbath. Number three, the second coming. Number four, the state of the dead. Number five, the sanctuary. Number six, the spirit of prophecy. These are not up for grabs. These are non-negotiables. And they are the pillars and the foundation of this church. And if we cling to these scriptural truths, we will retain our identity. And if we retain our identity, it will drive our mission. And soon and very soon, this church will get its act together and we'll be going home. In December, I was in Romania. I close with a story. I was in Romania in December. And I was up a little later than I should have been one evening and I was watching television, which is something that I don't normally do. Since my wife and I solved this whole television problem, we just got rid of we never owned one. We do not own one. That's the best way, by the way, to not watch television. It's real easy. Just don't own one. Don't have any time anyway. I was watching television, and uh, when I do watch, it's usually some kind of a news program, and it was CNN. This was right in the wake of September 11th. I think it was sometime, it was December, so about three months later. And they had a talk show, question and answer period, on CNN. And they had three representatives from the three major monotheistic religions. They had a Catholic priest. They had a Muslim imam. Is that right, Dr. Oster? Imam? I'm not sure it's right or not. And they had a Jewish rabbi. So they had this talk, talk show. And they were discussing with the Catholic priest, who I suppose was there to represent both Catholics and Protestants. And they had this imam who was representing the Muslims, and they had a rabbi who was representing the Jews. I don't remember all of their qualifications, but I remember that they were very learned and erudite men who were probably well capable of speaking for their respective denominations. Probably very much like having a a Doug Batchelor or Mark Finley speak on behalf of Seventh-day Adventists. We would have confidence in what they would say. Well, these three men were being asked a battery of questions about how 9-11 had affected their various religions. 
And they asked this man, the rabbi, how do you feel like it's affected Judaism? And he gave his answer. They asked the same thing of the Catholic priest and he gave his answer. And it was really very intriguing. And about 30 minutes into the program, the rabbi made a very interesting statement. He said, you know, 9-11 is a product of people thinking that they have a copyright on truth. That's what he said. The moment that he said that, the Catholic priest and the imam joined right in and said, that's right. And what happened was about a ten minute discussion from that point onward in which the priest and the rabbi and the imam went on to castigate as foolhardy and naive and ridiculous any single group that claims to have the truth. And it was really kind of interesting to watch because I thought to myself, well, wait a minute. This Catholic's not really being very square with those people because I know that his church teaches that they have the truth. But anyway, that's not the point. They went on and on and on and they talked about how anybody that would be so uh, ridiculous and ludicrous to teach that they have the truth, they're the criminals. You following me? Yes or no? Now, that was obviously in reference to people like Osama bin Laden and others who take this to a militant, fundamental extreme, but it dawned on me as I was listening to this program, wait a minute, I know a group of people who think they have the truth. Now, I suppose that makes us criminals in the eyes of these three monotheistic religions. Beloved, we are living in a day and age in which it is unpopular to say that you're right. Are you with me? It is also unpopular to tell others that they're wrong. So the spirit of the age is, if I think that two plus two is six, you don't tell me that it's not. In fact, you might think that two plus two is eight, and you and I are going to get along just fine. Because I'm not going to tell you that two plus two is not eight, and you're not going to tell me that two plus two is not six, and we're, we're going to get along just fine. That's called pluralism. Everybody has a little bit of the truth, right? Now, listen very carefully. That's pluralism. Relativism is when we get together and we decide we're going to come up with a compromise. And since you think it's eight, and I think it's six, we come to an agreement that based on the average, it's really seven. And now we're going to get along fine, and that's called relativism. And two plus two, we finally decide, is in fact seven. Now here's the point. Just because somebody says that two plus two is six, seven, or eight, doesn't mean it's true. I still believe that two plus two is four. How about you? Now, I also believe that the Bible can be understood. How about you? And I also believe that the truths that we believe as a church are right. Amen. And if you have right teachings and you have a group of people that are teaching right teachings, that must make them right. And beloved, that is going to get us very unpopular in the days to come. It is going to get us very unpopular in the days to come. Now, I want to say something at the end of this message so that you can be very careful. You have nothing to be proud of. Did you hear what I said? It is not because of your goodness that God called you to be a Seventh-day Adventist. God called you to be a Seventh-day Adventist in spite of who you are, not because of who you are. Amen. We have nothing to glory in except in the cross. Through whom the Lord, through whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. But today I want to say I still believe that this church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy. That is my sense of identity and that's why I'm willing to expend myself and my energy and my money and my time and everything that I am to preach this message. Not just because I think it's good advice, but because I think it is the message of the hour. Beloved, do you believe that today? Do you believe that today? Amen. I believe it with all my heart. Adventist amnesia, who are we? We are, based upon the authority of the Scriptures, the remnant church of prophecy. If you believe that, stand to your feet and pray with me. Stand to your feet and pray with me. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are not better than others. Nobody knows that better than you. Lord, for some reason, unbeknownst to us, 
and available only to your divine knowledge, you have called us. And Father, I am still amazed that you called me. Lord, you must be scraping the bottom of the barrel to call people like us. Father, we just want to glory today in your calling. We want to glory today in your truth. We want to glory today in your church. Father, it is not about us. It's about you and your word. And Father, you have called us. You have denominated us. You have given us a name. I believe that you chose in the celestial courts, in the days of eternity, you chose the name Seventh-day Adventist. Father, we should never be afraid of it. We should never be ashamed of it. But we should say it with humility, pride, and reverence. Father, you have called us, unworthy though we be, Nothing in our hands we bring. Simply to your cross and your word we cling. In Jesus' name, amen.